there's ways to, to format text to give it emphasis, to indicate that maybe it's a quote that you pulled out of somewhere, and so on. So I'm not really going to go over that in too much detail. I'll probably use some of the tags throughout the class, but I urge you to read that on your own. Um, it's always my philosophy in class um, to not read and go over the book verbatim, right? Because you have the book, you can read it. Why not? Um, there's no need for me to do that. Uh, therefore, I talk about the things that I want to emphasize and talk about the things that I think are particularly important that I think I can give you some additional insight to that maybe I can help. And the thought is, is that between the book and my lectures, you get some more material covered from a couple different perspectives, and that's sort of a good way uh, to go. So today, we're going to talk about, um, this week, we're going to talk about a few things that you can do to make your pages start look more like uh, a completed web page. Uh, because really, thus far in this course, everyone's web page has looked almost virtually identical. All right? Um, and therefore, we're going to talk about things such as images. We're going to talk about things such as cascading style sheets. Because those are both things that you can do to, with images, give additional content other than just plain words. A picture is worth a thousand words, right? So we're going to talk about effective use of images and some of the things you can do with that. Uh, but first, we're going to talk about cascading style sheets. Uh, because cascading style sheets allow us to specify a certain appearance for the page. Uh, there's three main technologies in web development uh, for the client-side code, which it's called. The, in other words, the, what, what composes a web page, what gets sent to the browser. And the three main technologies are HTML. This is where the content of the page comes from. So all the content on the pages is in HTML. It is uh, links, it's paragraphs, headings, all sorts of stuff. There is CSS, which is the appearance and the layout. We can define structure in HTML, like this page has three sections in it. Here's the header, here's the nav, and so on. But physically, how's that going to be lay out, laid out? Are they going to be side by side? Or are they going to be stacked on top of each other? How are those sections physically going to appear on the page? That's controlled with CSS. And then finally, JavaScript, which we'll talk semester covers interactivity and behavior. All right. So those are the three pieces of the puzzle. And we're going to spend most of our time on these two. So far, we've done everything. Everything we've done in classes related to HTML. From here on in, we're going to be split approximately 50-50 between HTML and CSS, because both of them are very, very important. It's not just important what you, uh, what contents on your web page, that's certainly important, but how it looks and how it's laid out and how it's structured and how it's laid out, not just to make it pretty, but how it's laid out and structured and designed to make it more useful to people, right? Because we could have a web page with a lot of stuff on it, but if everything is squeezed together and smashed together and there's no colors and so on, that makes it very difficult to read and understand and separate the page into sections and so on. So therefore, that's what we're going to do with CSS. We're going to do it not just to make the pages look attractive. That's a goal, all right? But we're also going to try to make the pages more usable by organizing them. You know, if you look at a book is organized in a certain way. All right? You don't open a book and it just starts at the very beginning and continuous block of words from the beginning of the book until the end. It's separated into chapters. There's spacing 
around the chapters. There's headings in the book. There's a table of contents. There's an index. All these things make the book more usable. Well, the design, the visual design in CSS, we're going to do to make the web page more usable. So let's start out by looking at a page that we did last time, and we're going to add some style to it. Here's the page that we had from last time. A reminder, by the way, I grade the labs in lab. I grade your assignments in lab. So uh, I know this class is a mix of online. You know, there's people watching uh, this video that are taking the online section, so this doesn't apply to you. But the people in the campus class, ideally before lab, before it's due, you should upload your assignment to Canvas, and then I will grade them in lab and I like you to be there so I can give you any feedback immediately and I can give you a little bit more thorough feedback. All right, uh, let's look here at something we did last time. We'll look at this page. No, that's not the one. Okay, we have two pages. And we had a home page. And we had what was supposed to be a tutorial. Okay. Every one of your web pages look like this, uh, unless you've worked ahead. All right, because this is what we've covered. This is a default for the browser. Remember, the browser has defaults for everything, how it looks, all right? So, for example, the links are underlined in blue. That's the default on most browsers. Links are underlined in blue, all right? When we visit a link, it changes to sort of a magenta color, all right? So, Links that we haven't visited are blue. Links that we have visited are magenta. H1s are the biggest heading. H2s are the second biggest heading. Each paragraph starts on, an, on its own line. Normal text is a certain size. The background is white. The text is black. All these things are defaults all right, in the browser. Because if you don't supply any CSS, the browser still has to display your page. So it has some default rules on how it displays your page. All right, and that's what these are. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to start changing that. And as we start putting CSS into our page, what we're doing effectively is we're overriding the browser's defaults. Now, it's not an all or nothing thing. If we specify one thing, it'll override the browser's default for that thing. But all the rest of the browser defaults stay in effect. So for example, let's say I change the background color of this page to something else. 
It'll change the background color of the page, but the rest of the page will still be using the browser defaults that it always did. All right? So from here on in, the way your pages look are a combination of your CSS and the browser defaults. And your CSS takes precedence over the browser defaults. All right? Your CSS overrides that. Now, there's a couple ways that you can put CSS on a page. We're going to do the simplest, most straightforward way first, and then we're going to change it to do maybe a little bit better way. But I think it's easier if we put the CSS on the same page as the HTML, all right, and in the same file. So I'm going to go into this file, and it's called Finished. I'm going to edit with Notepad++. And then start putting CSS in. Now, CSS is another thing that appears in the head section of the web page. And if we're going to do CSS this way, we're going to have a style tag. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can do CSS. And this is one way, um, and it's probably the easiest to learn first. So we're going to learn this way first, and then we'll go on to the, to the other way. So with that style tag, it's an HTML tag. It has a start and end. And what this tells the browser is everything between the start style and the end style is not HTML. It's not content for the page, but instead it's a it's style code that describes how the page is going to look and how it's going to be laid out. Now, I'm going to start out doing this. I hope there's no one colorblind. Is there anyone that's colorblind? All right, and let me know if you're watching this online and you're colorblind because I'll try to be careful with the references I make. But I'm going to use, for this example, I'm going to use different shades of gray anyhow. All right? So I would hope you'd be able to notice, even, even if you are colorblind, uh, this. So it doesn't matter the exact colors I use. In these examples, I try to make it very obvious with the colors that I use. Um, so um, hopefully you'll be able to tell, even if you are colorblind. All right, CSS consists of two things. Consists of a selector, then it has a list of attributes. The selector describes what part of the page gets the rule. We then have these curly braces, and inside those curly braces are going to be the rule. In other words, what properties of the page we're going to change, what characteristics of the page we're going to change, and what we're going to change them to. Now, there are several different kinds of selectors, but the first simplest kind of selector is an actual HTML tag. So if I say body, that means everything in the body gets this rule. All right? So if I say body, everything in the body gets this rule. Well, guess what? Everything in the body is the entire page, right? Because the entire page is in the body section. What we see here, all of that is in the body section. So if I say body, that means the entire page gets this rule. All right? So that's the selector. Now, I can specify a property, and there's a predefined list of properties. One of them is background. and I can specify a color. So I can say body, background, gray. So 
So what does this tell us? How do we read this CSS rule? This tells us that what is going to get this rule? The entire body, the entire page. What does the rule consist of? The page, the, the page itself, the background of the page, is going to be gray. So if I save this in here and refresh, this page now looks like that. The background is gray, but everything else about the page stayed the same. Why? Because I only overrode that one property. I only said, I want to change the background of the body of the page. So therefore, everything else gets stuck with the, with the defaults. All right? Now, what do you suppose I would happen if I said instead header has a background of gray? What do you suppose would happen there? It's a selector. It describes what gets that rule. So therefore, only this stuff, only stuff in the header would get that rule. So the rest of the page would have the default. It would be white. And this section would be gray. So let's do that to verify. Sure enough, that section got the color, and the rest of the page is at the default. So I can give a different selector to different sections of the page. Questions? The other thing I can do besides changing the background is I can change the color of the text. And you do that by saying text, colon, and then white. Notice how this rule works, how these rules work. Selector, outside of the braces. Inside of the braces, there's pairs. Name of the attribute, a colon, the value of the attribute, semicolon. The name of the attribute, a colon, the name of the next attribute, the semicolon. So if we do that then, oh, that's wrong. It's not text. Hmm, let's say I make a mistake. What can we do? Well, we can Google it. And we can look. Ah, it's not text, it's just color. My mistake. Can't believe I made that mistake, but it's a Monday. So if I say background white, color, I'm sorry, black, background gray, color white, it will make the color of the text be white. And there we go. Now, CSS does what's called cascading, all right? What does cascading mean? It means that you can define these rules on different levels, and they apply to everything, and the levels sort of override other levels. This is probably easier demonstrated than described. So I could put something in here like this. I could say body. background gray. I can then say header color white. Now, 
Let's think through how this is going to work. All right? Everything in the body section is going to have a background of gray. That includes the header, right? Because the header is part of the body. So that cascades over and includes everything in the body section. I then say color of the header is white is going to change the header and only the header's text color to white. So the result of this is going to be the entire page is going to be gray, and the text in the header page is going to be white. Another way to put this is that the way something look doesn't just depend on one style rule. It can depend on other style rules. So the background part of it came from this part of the style rule. The text color came from this part of the style rule. Now, I can also define properties and override them. Let's try this. Let's make the text of the entire page white. All right. I specified that the background is gray and that all the text has a color of white. Now I can do this. I can override one of those properties for something underneath it. I could say, for example, article background black. And why is it like this? Well, I said everything on the page starts off with getting a background of gray and a color of white. But this sort of cascades over top of it. It overrides that. So for all the articles on the page, everything in this part of an article tag, it gets this additional rule that overrides just part of the rule of the body. So in other words, the text is still white. Why? Because I didn't override it here. But the background is overridden, and for the article, the background is black. No, if you were to switch them, it still works. All right. Because it's not really dependent on the position that determines the overriding, it's determined by like which one of these is more specific. So if I give a command for an article, an article's part of the body, just a subsection of the body. So the article is like underneath the body. So what I define on the article is going to override anything I've defined on the body. Likewise, within this article, I have an H1. So if I say H1, background red, oops, that's going to override the background of gray and the background of article, because it's the innermost thing. So these style rules sort of take precedence the more innermost that you go. I know sometimes I come up with really ugly pictures or, or designs because I want to make the color changes dramatic. Now, if I did this and made the color red for this, it's going to get the back black from the article and the text color of red from the H1 tag. All right, 
questions on this? Yes. Okay. Y yes. There, there's other selectors besides the uh, the the uh, HTML tag, and one of the other selectors is class, and one of the other selectors is ID. So uh, this is a little ahead of ourselves, but that's okay. All right. I could do something like this. Let me make sure. Yeah, there we go. I could go and say dot web. Maybe the web headings I want to look different. All right, for whatever reason. And I background white color purple everything i class of web2 would get that role. So, the things I gave a class of web to, I forgot to do it on the list. Would get that style role. But none of the other lists, none of the other paragraphs, none of the other links get that style role. Because I've said that class. The other thing we can use is we can use IDs. And an ID, a class can point to more than one thing, right? You know, if you talk about a class of vehicle, you know, uh, a, a truck, there's more than one truck in the world, right? So when we talk about a class of something, we're talking about uniquely one thing. Or, or, or I'm sorry, we're not talking about uniquely one thing, we're talking about multiple things. When we talk about an ID, though, we're talking to one specific thing, all right? And it can only be one thing. So if I say ID ASP NAT, I'm sorry, an ID is represented with the pound sign, ASP NAT background yellow color red. And notice how that one pair, that one thing that I put an ID on looks different. The body will always be the entire page. Now again, the kind of selectors I'm going to emphasize mostly are going to be these, for now. All right? Uh, this, this is a little ahead of ourselves. I mean, I, you know, I figure if you ask the question, I'll answer it. But this isn't something I'm going to emphasize right away. Later on in the semester, we'll come back to this. But if you do want to do something with that, you'll either use a class or an ID in your style rule. So let me take these back out. OK. What colors are you allowed to use? Well, most of the basic colors 
have a names, have names for them. So if we Google CSS or we Google HTML colors, color names, we can see the names. All modern browsers support the following 140 color names. Alice Blue, Antique White, Aqua, Aquarine, Beige, Bisque, Black, Blue, and so on down the line. So you can use any of these color names. And it'll work. Now, there's more than 140 colors, though, out there, right? You know, if you take a photograph, you know, it's amazing to see all the different colors that you have, even in a simple photograph, all the different shades and things like that. So how do you represent colors other than these 144 colors? You represent them one of two ways. One way is with what's called a hex code. And that's this code that we see right here. And another way is through the use of what's called an RGB code. And an RGB code specifies values for how much red's in the color, how much green's in the color, how much blue's in the color. Actually, that's what this hex code does too. It just does it in a different way. So, let's go back to this page. I'm going to get rid of the whole style. And I'm going to go to body. And I could say body background green. Make it red. There it is. The body is red. I could also say body RGB two fifty five zero zero. So there's three numbers. RGB implies that they're in that order, red, green, blue. The numbers go from 0 to 255. 0 is the lowest, 255 is the highest. So what this says is, this says that I want it to be as red as possible, but with no green and no blue mixed in. So if I'm making it as red as possible, with no green or no blue mixed in, what color is it going to be? It's going to be a very bright red. So if I do this, I get the exact same result. If I turn down the red a little bit, it's going to be a darker red. So it's not going to be as bright as a red because I've turned down the red a little bit. I've actually cut it in half. So it should be a fairly dramatic difference. All right. Now, if I start mixing in other stuff, I can get different shades. So for example, what do you suppose if I did this? What color do you think it's going to be? It's going to be purple because Red is halfway turned up, there's no green, and blue is halfway turned up. So it's going to be a purple. Now if I crank up the red, it's going to be more of a reddish purple. If I crank up the blue, It's going to be more of a bluish purple.
Well, you suppose if I have all these at zero, what's it going to be? It's going to be black. What do you suppose if I make them all 255? It will be white. What do you suppose if I make them all in the middle? It will be gray. And the shade of gray it will be will depend on whether the numbers are high or low. This is sort of a gray that's right smack dab in the middle. Whereas if I were to make all these maybe 200, it would be a shade of gray that is closer to white. What do you suppose if I did this? Whoops. Yeah, it would break. Who suppose if I did something like that? Very light red. Because it's almost white. It's just a little less green and blue than red. So it would be red, it'd be it'd be you can tell because it has the highest number, it's gonna be predominantly red. And but the other two are up there too, so it's going to be a very light, we've added more light to this, so it's going to be a very pale red. All right. Now here's the good news about this. All right, is that it's good that you understand this, but it's not essential. You can code this without understanding this. The other way of doing this is with a hexadecimal code. Now, how many of you have heard the word hexadecimal before? Okay, well, that's more than I thought, actually. Hexadecimal is base 16. And in, with two hexadecimal digits, you can express a number from 0 to 255. Sounds familiar, right? Because that's what these RGBs are. And you do it with two hexadecimal characters. The digits in hexadecimal are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. A, B, C, D, E, F. So it's just a matter of converting those RGBs into hexadecimal to get it to work. So ex for example, 255, this is an easy one. That is FF in hexadecimal. If you don't believe me, do the math. Take 15 times 16 and then add, that's 240, then add 15 to it. You got 255. So if I do the code like this with a pound sign, I'm using the hexadecimal code, where the first two digits are the amount of red from 0 to 255, except expressed in hex. So instead of from 0 to 255 uh, in decimal, it's from 00, zero to FF in hexadecimal. And then no red, I'm sorry, no green and no blue, this will be a bright red. If I turn this down, it's going to be a darker red. Letters are not case sensitive, so you can make them AA or lowercase AA. And again, it's good, if, it's good if you know this, right? But it's not absolutely essential because if we look, almost every HTML color chart will show you the name if there is one along with the hex code. So if I wanted sky blue, I could put sky blue in or I could put this. So just looking at this code, A, C, E. In hexadecimal, E, B is bigger than C, E, and is bigger than 8, 7. So therefore, I know that this is predominantly some shade of blue. And there you go. 
Now, with this, we can see way more than 140 colors. It would be 16 to the 6 power, whatever that calculates to be. It's a big number. All right? And it's almost like a paint chart, right? Where you have a lot of different colors here and you can pick them. Now, remember I said that there's 140 web safe colors, but most browsers are going to support a lot more than that. There's ways to show the color and so on. So with these, all you have to do is find a color you like, like that one. And that is the hex code for it. So even without knowing what that hex code represents, you just have to be able to pick the one you want and copy and paste. Now, a few things to be concerned about. Number one is you still want your text to be readable, right? So make sure there's sufficient contrast between the colors. All right. Why do we make our why do we why are we interested in making our web page different colors? Yes. To make it stand out, to make it attractive. That's certainly a goal, right? Uh, an organization's website is a way that it market, markets itself. It's sort of its face on the web. And therefore, you want it to look as good as possible. But the other reason is to make things stand out and make the user able to visually organize your page without even thinking about it. So for example, if I did something like this, That, at a glance, separates the page into sections. All right? So, yeah, this makes the page look better. You know, it's nicer to have a little bit of color on the page instead of it all being black and white, and it looks attractive. All right? But it's also done purposefully, because this allows me easily to see the different sections of the page. So, a lot of people think of web design simply as making the page look as pretty as possible. That's part of it. But making the page functional and making the page easier for, easy for someone to understand at a glance. You know, without even reading the content, I can see where the different sections are. I don't have to stop and think and wonder where they are. Now, the other reason you'd pick colors is to sort of give it a branding with your organization. You know, typically organizations, their logos, have colors and so on. Uh, in addition, there's a mood a lot of times that you're trying to evoke when you're going to a web page. For example, what color would you guess is dominant on the web page for Barbie? Pink. Let's see if we're right. Oh, looky there. Not exclusively pink, but there's a lot of pink in it, just as we expected. Anyone like heavy metal music? No? Can someone name a heavy metal band? Let's look up Ozzy Osbourne, Never Let Me Down. Let's look up Ozzy Osbourne. Oh, I, I shouldn't have said it. 
I'm going to close it real quick. What color do you think Ozzy's page is going to be? Black. It's going to be black. I was going to say, if it's anything other than black, I was going to say I'd do something, but it's too early Monday to, to make dares. Shocker, it's black, predominantly black. So you use colors also to create a mood, create a brand, image, and so on. So it's not just about making your page look nice. It's about adding functionality to your page. And it's about giving your page sort of a mood that matches it. Um, absolutely. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next time. But um, you want to. If you keep in mind the reasons that you use colors, if you start using too many colors, that actually doesn't emphasize anything, right? That becomes distracting, right? So if you use colors to sort of point out important stuff and, and sort of show how your page is dividing, if you use 100 different colors, then it all sort of just blurs together. And it's almost the same as using no colors or one color, right? So therefore, you want to be careful not to, to overkill with this. All right. Next time, we'll spend a little more time talking about colors and CSS, and then we'll probably get into images. All right. Are there any questions? All right. We'll see you up in lab.